it is, uh, at least in this time zone, it's uh, January 28th, 2013, and this is uh, ET MOOC, or X MOOC, as a lot of people are saying, uh, pronouncing it. I'm not sure what the right thing is. Um, today, tonight, we have a uh, special guest, Dave Cormier, and he's going to present on the topic of rhizomatic learning. Um, I, I, some of you probably have heard Dave or have read Dave. Um, I happen to meet him at least once or twice, and uh, our paths cross quite often um, online as well. Um, uh, I consider Dave uh, probably one of the most brightest and intelligent people speaking on the topic of any of this connected learning stuff, and so we're really happy to have him tonight. Um, this particular topic really kind of pushes the fold uh, into some new and exciting ideas around learning, and I think it's just really exciting with this, you know, rhizomatic learning, how it relates to the connected, connected to learning, the network web, and, and you know, basically the sort of chaotic way of learning that we're looking at these days. And so I think Dave really does well to sort of bring a lot of order to this. So I'm really excited to hear Dave, so I'm going to pass it right on to him. Um, and of course, uh, I think most of you probably understand Blackboard Collaborate. We're totally welcome you, you to uh, chat in the, in the chat room, of course, if you want to also um, back channel in Twitter. Not that we could stop you, but we also encourage that as well. So uh, anyway, you'd like to participate, ask questions, try to make this a bit uh, interactive, and uh, of course, uh, help Dave sort of kind of figure out this topic. I think he does this. He's got a real great way of um, sort of co-creating knowledge in sessions like this. So anyway, off to, over to you, Dave. Thanks, Alec. Uh, that was a really nice intro. You can uh, you can come along to my classes all the time and give me intros like that. That'd be really sweet. Um, just a couple of other notes about Collaborate. For those of you who are sending private messages back and forth, uh, all the moderators can see them. Um, and you know, you guys are saying super nice things now, but just in the future, uh, just so you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, they all just noticed. Good, excellent. Um, here is my advanced button. Here, here it is. So. Um, my name, I just got a quick idea of who I am first. This is uh, actually taken by CogDog at a conference. Uh, I like to get this photo up there. I don't know. Uh, this is kind of the way that I approach everything. Um, I've been looking at rhizomatic learning now for, I don't know, maybe seven years, six years. I don't claim to totally understand it yet. Um, I think that it has emerged out of the work that I've done and the work of a lot of my colleagues. I couldn't possibly cite all the people who've been involved in shaping the work that I do, but I can tell you that it is very much something that comes out of working and, and operating online and in the networked way that I think learning happens best. So in a sense, it's self-referential. It's, it's me trying to describe the learning I've done, the learning that I try to structure for my students, and um, the learning that I see around me happening out on the internet. I think it was Northern Voice in 2011, Cogdog. I think you're totally right. So this talk is partially me trying to explain ideas around the rhizome, connecting it to a little bit of complexity, and then also talking about how the MOOC is an example or can potentially be an example of rhizomatic learning. Uh, I like to start out these things with a question that structures the talk or hopefully gives people a place, and I'd like you guys to dive right into the middle of the slide and hopefully help me answer it from your own perspective. So my question then is, what's the purpose of learning? I understand that this is a kind of a broad question, but it, it really does help shape, for me at least, an understanding of who you guys are. Uh, people tend to answer this question a lot of different ways. So just get on the white screen here, and there we go. And just type in what you think, what's that for you? What's the purpose of learning? Um, what's the reason we get involved in the process? To gain skills and ideas, okay, there's an important component of that, that those pieces that um, of acquired knowledge that we take in, that we uh, allow us to help shape things, to get extra skills, to change and grow for brains. I hope that person doesn't mean to eat brains, but that's the way that whole brains thing strikes me. Uh, building knowledge, curiosity, satisfy curiosity, problem solving, enhance our lives, uh, keep our brains active as I age. I don't know who all of that person is, but that's a fair point. Um, so we got some skills, sort of basic, like sort of functional. Uh, approaches here, some ideas that are about shaping your life and your lifelong learning. Um, some people who look at learning from a purely teacher perspective, so to encourage students to be productive citizens. There are a lot of assumptions, I think, built into a lot of these perspectives, and certainly a lot of assumptions built into what I'm looking to expand the skill base. 
being human, critical discourse and action, advance a career. The career point, I think, is a really, a really important one as well. Uh, certainly, there are lots of people who see the learning process as a, as a straight line, right, from where I am today to where, um, to where I want to get tomorrow. It's a purely functional one. To grow as empathetic beings. Wow. If only empathy was something we were all striving for. Uh, and there again, I show my bias. But I think one of the things that, that I find challenging when I talk about learning and change and, and all the stuff that we've been involved in since, um, well, for me at least, since the MOOC thing has gone crazy and I've been involved in, uh, in various discussions about change in education, is that if you look at this board right in front of us now, if we all take a second and pause and look through here, we have 10, 15, 20 different perspectives on what learning is for. And I think when we talk about the importance of learning to us when we talk about trying to enact change inside of our schools, inside of our culture, uh, it's important to keep in mind that even amongst people who have all self-selected to come together to one place to work with Alec and, and all the people who are organizing this course, who uh, obviously have access to the internet, there are all kinds of ways in which we're all similar, we still have these very, very different ideas about what the learning process is. And I just thought that I've done this this kind of ask the question a little bit differently every time, but I always end up with this sort of amazement at how we can all be involved in the educational process, all be in the same sort of skill, involved in the same field, I guess you could call it, and yet still have all this hugely diverse understanding. Now, for me, all of these things are true. This is learning. It's all these things together. But and when we look at... Um, some of the responses, some of the other sort of specific things that the, um, the XKCD cartoon is one that always strikes me. Um, uses limits to career success. We talked about careers in the last one. Um, that one weekend messing with Pearl. The way that learning is not something that's always planned. It's not something that's always directed. It's not something that always happens structured inside of a classroom. It's something that happens whenever you come across it, right? And nobody knows what part of learning is going to be the thing that you actually need in the future, whether it be career-based, whether it be that knot you learned how to tie that saves you from falling out of a tree. It, it doesn't matter what part of learning and how it interacts with you later, but that there's always an uncertainty that's part of that process because we don't know what things we're going to need in the future, what problems we're going to need to solve. And we're not always going to be sure, to respond to Stephen's tweet from earlier, to, from just before the show, we're not always going to be sure what it is that's going to be better and what that better is going to look like. So for me, and then the foundational piece of, of what I do, is that learning is about preparing yourself for uncertainty. Now, if I said, just try to work with me here, assume for a second that I'm a genius and I know what I'm talking about, and let's assume that learning is about preparing for uncertainty, what kinds of uncertainty would you be preparing yourself for? So try to fill in this board here for a second and try to tell me what that would look like. This is a harder question. Of course, you get to the next order of thinking, I suppose. So for me, a, a simple example might be reading through um, cooking sites. So you're not actually trying to cook anything. You're just trying to have those ideas in place so that when you're standing in front of the stove and you're thinking, this doesn't quite work, I, I need to... I need to choose to put something in here. You have some other things around you, whether they be, like the person said two slides ago, skills or ideas that are there, whether they be approaches, whether they be experiences that people share. To know, love, and serve God, that's interesting. Yeah, thousands of years of that too, isn't there? Changes in the environment, adaptations, every new and unfamiliar, everything that's new and unfamiliar and novel, the environment, the world that doesn't exist. It's pretty tough to be involved in any discussion around education and not at some point hearing something to the effect that we're trying to prepare our students for a world that doesn't exist yet. So we're teaching them inside of our schools for a future that we don't yet understand. And if we believe that, and I think a lot of us do, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us do, if we believe that, that we're preparing for an uncertain, unknown future, down by the check mark here in the bottom left hand corner. If that's true, then our learning, our whole learning process should be about preparing people for uncertainty, preparing people for decision making, preparing them, 
giving them the skills they need to get into situations so that when uh, pardon me so that when they're in those situations they know how to respond right how to sift through what's junk and what will last into that future how to sift through all the pieces and right now we're not in a world where knowledge is is scarce we have knowledge abundance right we need to be able to sift through things and choose what we need to do and to be able to bring forward Yeah, I'll agree with Allison. We need to be agile. So this is sort of the foundational idea at the back of rhizomatic learning, is that what we're trying to do is develop an educational, and realistically, this idea came after the fact, right? I didn't understand when I first started out that that's where I was going. But for me, the best kind of learning prepares people for dealing with uncertainty. And that's the first of the points that I want to make is that I'm not trying to teach people things. I'm not trying to get them to remember things. I don't care that they come out agreeing with me. I want them to be able to go, and if I'm teaching with the, the course that I'm going to be teaching in a couple of months, educational technology, and the adult learner, if they're confronted by a challenge, I want them to be able to be better decision makers about that challenge, about that idea, than they were when they came in. Right? That's what I consider the best end of learning. So that's point number one. Okay, so let's let's just slow down for a second there and see if we have any comments or questions that anybody wants to talk about. Any feelings anybody wants to share? Somebody's anything that we want to talk about here? I'm trying to go back over. Somebody which part of learning is creating the future? Hmm. In a sense all parts of them are, I guess, Rod. That's kind of where we are. Is all the content we teach them. Let's let's take that one there about the prepare for uncertainty because I think that'll help draw out some of these ideas. So giving people content is one of the things that can help you prepare for uncertainty. Having ideas in your head certainly can. But that those are the the, the lower end things that you're going to need. Being able to have an education, a learning process where you're constantly forced to make decisions is the part that I think is particularly important there. Thank you for drawing on that uh, question mark. Life is all about problem solving. And it's about creativity too, right? So if your learning experience is one where um, all the decisions are made for you, where the, the outcomes are pre-stated, then that creativity and that problem solving doesn't happen, which brings us to, to point two here. I got the weird new page explorer, which I'm not used to yet. So, oh wow, this messed up my little number thingies. But anyway, number one there says number two. The community can be the curriculum learning when there is no answer. And that's the second part, the second point. And that's that if we have a learning experience where what people need to take on, the content that we need to deliver them is pre-described. When I decide before a course starts, what somebody needs to know, so at the end of this course, you will know A, B, C, D, and E. Once I've done that, I've taken creativity out of the conversation. Once I've done that, I've taken their ability to confront uncertainty and the practice of it during the learning process out of the way. So once you have decided what the single outcome of a, of a learning experience is, that's something that happens. So what I like to talk about in that sense is communities. Anybody uh, ever been to EdTech Talk? Anybody ever heard of EdTech Talk or been part of any of the shows or anything? Yeah. I'll deal with that relationship between creativity and uncertainty in a minute. So community learning is a beautiful thing. We've been talking about communities of practice for years, uh, since 1991, I guess, when the term was invented by um, uh, LeVay and uh, Wenger. And when you can get together, have a community, talk about your practice, learning starts to happen, right? When you find other people who are who know as much or more than you and you interact with each other, that learning process allows you to learn things. Now, not necessarily what you plan to learn when you start it. When you get together with a bunch of your colleagues and you start talking about your practice, there's no necessarily set plan for what outcomes you're going to learn from that discussion, but you do learn. You learn from their stories. You learn from their experiences. You learn by having them challenge yours. And there's something beautiful about that. And there's something that allows for 
new things to emerge whenever you have that community interaction around uh, that. I'll be getting to assessment in a minute. <laughs> now, that's a really good question, and it's one that, that I think is um, a really important one. Thank you, Aaron, for bringing that up. So um, in terms of that, that community model, that idea that we can get together with other people who know stuff like we know stuff and learn stuff, Dave loves positivism. Man, there's always somebody who taunts me that way. All right, so let's take a look at that community question. What have you guys been involved? What kinds of community learning involvements are you in? Like it could be your staff room, it could be formal online communities. What kinds of, and again, this is an invitation to scribble on the screen here. What kinds of other MOOCs? Yeah, sure. Informal groups or groups, that's okay too. Somebody who's playing tic tac toe, that's got to be the cog dog. Um, DS106, graduate work. Personal learning, C, PLC, personal learning community, online, online masters, informal groups, chat with work and colleagues, blogging, yeah, that's been a big one for me. Uh, I mean, that's how I met Alec um, originally, and he's certainly had a huge influence on my work. I started using the word open um, from reading Alec's blog. I don't think I've ever told him that, uh, but it was really the thing that allowed me to understand what I was trying to do and then started to talk to him and comment on his stuff, and he comments on mine and made a big difference. Somebody read my blog. Not anymore, Alec, just at one time in the last. Okay. Right. It's my belief that many, 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 like an awful lot of the learning we do happens this way. From people we know, from our moms. I learned, I've learned lots from my mom, you know. Those kinds of informal learning situations that are about being part of communities, just being in a house, being in a family. Um, you learn lots of things about how to do any kind of thing. Yay, moms, indeed. You never go wrong in an educational community saying hi, it's giving the props to the moms. I'm alone in my school, I have very little community. That's hard. I mean, that's one of those places where the internet can really help you. And there's a lot of people who work, I mean, I, I think of my partner who does her PhD here at the University of Prince Edward Island. Um, Bonnie Stewart, and she's the only person who does the kind of work that she does here. And yet, online, she has a massive sort of community network of people who do the work she does and also people who are in those PhDs. Feels like private practice. Look at that, all the lonely people over there on the left hand side of the screen. Um, hey, PA I love, excellent. Yes, Bonnie Stewart. Um, yeah, she's my partner. You probably heard her talk about MOOCs as well, where she's right over there, it's about eight feet from me waving. Okay, so that community learning piece is something that I desperately wanted to bring into my classrooms. The problem is, anybody who's ever been involved in a community, is that you can't take your finger and point at a community and say, today we're going to learn this, right? It's not going to happen. You don't have that authority. It's a community. It has its own rules, it has its own practices, things emerge out of them. They're great ways of learning, but you can't say, okay, community, for the next 10 weeks, we're going to do this thing over here because they're going to scatter and do whatever they want and form little groups and, and keep doing the things that they were doing before. So for me, the hope with rhizomatic learning was to take some of the great creative outputs that come from community learning and apply them to a structured classroom. And when I say structured, I mean anything that's a course. Right, so how do I take these things? Mom's rule. Nice one. How do I take these things and apply them in? First rule of community learning is to give up control. I think that's totally true. All right. So what I started talking about then was trying to talk about, sorry, I'm going to kill your tic-tac-toe game, is trying to talk about rhizomatic learning and talk about the rhizomes. Anybody here know what a rhizome is? Give me a yes, no in the, uh, in the chat room. Nodes, but no center, like a rhizomatic plant. Yeah, it is like a rhizomatic plant. Looked it up today. Very cool. Bing. Okay, so about half the people. I have bamboo in my garden. So, uh, Jay Walkus, you know my pain and misery about what happens whenever you have rhizome in your garden, when you have a bamboo in your garden. The terror cells work like this, too. 
Um, I can't speak authoritatively on that, um, so I'll let that one slide. But let's talk a little bit about that rhizome and how it's similar to this community thing and how it actually is involved in this conversation. That's why I hate junipers. Rhizomes are crazy. They're a way in which plants spread, right? So they move and interact with their environment. They go out horizontally inside of a plant. They're not quite the reproductive part of the plant. They're like the middle piece. And they spread out and they move and they and then you take out a little piece of a rhizome, a little tiny little snippet of that root there, that rhizome part there, and you drop it anywhere else, the whole plant's going to just start to grow again. And it doesn't grow from a single thing. It just keeps spreading, and they shoot up in various places. It's a very disorderly, dirty, messy plant, but it's resilient. And it has a lot of qualities that um, a number, a, a couple of French philosophers in 19, um, 1980 wrote this book called The Thousand Plateaus, you know, Gilles Deleuze and uh, Felix, Felix Guattari. And they talked about something called the, the idea of the rhizome and how the nature of the rhizome can be a really nice, and they, would, they wouldn't say metaphor, but let's just say metaphor for how we can think about things. And I, and I pulled out three of the things that they said to talk about here. So one of them is they can map in any direction from any starting point. So there's no preset way in which a rhizome is going to go. It's going to follow kind of its environment. It's going to go around rock. It's going to go towards the water that it might feel over there. And it's going to kind of spread around. You can encourage it, but you no, know, it's never a metaphor. Yes, Caleb, I understand. Um, but trying to explain the distinction, I just don't want to get into it. Um, so the rhizome then um, is it's unpredictable. It's responsive. It can move, and grow, and spread via experimentation within a context. So what will happen with a rhizome is that if it runs up against the wall, it'll start crawling down the wall, and it'll start curving around. It'll go, sounds like my tech use, very similar to a lot of ways that people teach themselves how to do things. So the other thing is, is that they don't need to be predefined. They don't need to, to have a single path, right? So no matter how you break them, no matter how you deal with them, they keep on growing, right? It's not a, it's not a set linear narrative path, right? And that's also another quality of the rhizome that can be really useful. And it was funny, today on Twitter, today on Twitter, somebody said, oh, we're talking about rhizomes tonight. That's great. I wrote a blog post about them yesterday. And here's what she wrote. I'm a gardener, and I grow rhizome plants, asparagus, irises, lily of the valley, and cannas. I don't have to know that. So I know how they grow. They're lateral spread and that they're resilient. And that idea of lateral spread, that idea of the way in which it tends to move and encompass, right, is the way that I like to think about that learning process. As you start to move particularly together, right, as the, the, the ecosystem in which your, your learning grows, you spread out, right, not necessarily in a predefined way, not necessarily in a direction where you know exactly where the outcome is, but it continues to spread, right, it's not a spread that really describes my teaching, it's funny. It's interesting to see people sort of hitting with the metaphor. For some people, again, not metaphor, um, the story, right? It does a really nice job for some people of explaining how they do stuff. For other people, they find it very frustrating because it's difficult to control. There's no doubt this approach is very, very difficult to control. All right. So we're at uh, 826, so I think we're still on schedule here. Does anybody want to... <laughs> Super Bowl, nice. Does anybody want to stop and ask a couple of questions here? Let's take a break because we're right in the middle. I've got two more points I want to make, and then I want to make a couple of sort of general comments, and then maybe we can we can argue a little bit more. I think Pam, the the inch deep stuff is, is one of those things that I've heard a lot of. Um, and I think the, the deepness metaphor and the fact that, you know, what you end up doing here is only look at the surface of things, if that's the implication in what you're trying to say, um, is not so much what I mean by the lateral spread. Knowing is one of those things that is integrative, right? It tends to come together and it, it networks all the, the ideas that you have in your head tend to network together. And it's that kind of 
spreading out that I'm talking about, not as opposed to actually thinking deeply about things. Okay, I'm going to address, uh, take one more point here because it's going to lead into the next section. I'm going to take Janine's, um, is there a downside to rhizomatic other than complexity? Complexity, it certainly is way more complex. It's more work. It's harder to structure a classroom. It can get out of control uh, really easily. But there are some things that it does really badly. Uh, rhizomatic learning and the rhizomatic approach is a terrible, terrible way of learning, of getting those 10 people over there to learn those 10 things over there. So if you have a group of people who need to have five things that they pick up so that they never forget how to do them, this is a really bad way of going about doing it. Because it's not about giving people five things. It's not about deciding ahead of time what the five things are that they're looking to do, but rather taking the position, the philosophical position, that the things we really need to know, the complex things out there, the things that are really worth knowing, are not something that you can just hand over to people. They're things that you have to come to know, that you have to experience for yourself, and that you have to internalize for yourself, that you need to explore. You need to create your knowing about it. You need to incorporate it into yourself. Um, and that knowing a thing in that sense ends up being something that emerges out of you. All right, so that's, that's a really big problem. We're going to address that in the next point. Talk to the ATA about this. I don't know what that means. One slide left to go. I don't know what he's talking about. Anyway, next. All right, so like I said, my numbering system's all messed up here. Um, rhizomatic learning le works in the complex domain. One of the things that um, one of the things that Alec had brought up was that um, he added the idea of complexity to my title whenever he suggested it to me. And I said, oh, yeah, sure, we'll throw that in there too. Um, and it is an important comment because, like I said, um, if you take, um, this is the Kinevin model, um, and it's a way of thinking about challenges or decision making. And it's, it's used in business theory, but I think it's really helpful for, for learning. When we think about why we're learning, what we're learning, and what that process is. Yeah, it's from Dave Snowden. I should have that on this slide, um, but I don't. I apologize. This is Dave Snowden's. And when I think about learning, and I think about the things that rhizomatic learning seems to be good at, things in the simple domain, things that are best practice, it's not really good. You know, if you need to know the best practice of something, I'll go back to a tweet that I saw that came in just before the, the, the talk started when somebody said, um, all we really need to do is get the content in there and then the students can learn that content. If that's what we're doing, if what we're doing is saying, these are the 10 things, this is the process by which you start a car and here's the five-step process and if you follow that, you're good to go, then this is the wrong approach because um, if you're interested in simply transferring knowledge, then you should probably decide ahead of time what people should learn. And the wandery, sort of flexible, resilient process is not really going to be very helpful for you. The complicated domain is one where it takes an expert to be able to solve it. So it's, a, it's the sort of, it's not, oh, there's a definite answer and we've all agreed on what that is, but the answer is complicated. And I think the distinction between complicated and complex is really helpful. Um, in a complicated scenario, what we're looking for is the decision between two or three options that we all kind of know are the right options. So should I get an Apple or a PC is the one that I always use. Um, well, it kind of depends. It depends on a lot of things. But an expert can probably give you the right answer. It's almost impossible to teach someone how to answer complicated questions. Um, you really need to have that Harvard 10,000 hours of experience in something, and then you can kind of know what the general thing is inside of a field and give you know, an informed opinion. Where the, the chaotic situation, and I'll just I'll leave complex for last, the chaotic situation is one where you need to make a decision right now. There's no real idea of what you should do, but it requires immediate decision making. So, um, I'm drowning, I need to learn how to swim. Well, what way am I going to do it? It doesn't matter. I'm going to flap my arms until I work it out. Um, you know, um, in the communications department where I also use this, 
you know, something terrible has happened, we need to make a response right away. Um, what's the best way of doing that? It doesn't matter. We need to do something now, and then we need to sense how that respond, and then respond accordingly once we've had a chance to think. The most interesting part of learning to me is the stuff that happens in the complex domain. In the complex domain, there, there no, there's nothing vaguely resembling a right answer. So how should we approach um, ethics inside of medicine? Well, totally depends. You know, it totally depends on who you are and what your beliefs are and how you, how you respond to things and, and how much money. Like, there are tons and tons and tons of different things. And if you want to start doing something with it, well, then you need to try a few things, see how they work, amplify the things that are working better. And it's that complex understanding where you're taking lots and lots of different ideas and things from lots and lots of different places and trying to do stuff with them trying to make decisions about those things that I think is particularly interesting. Now, I know that I just glossed over um, something that took me months and months to totally understand in about uh, a minute and a half. So as a test, well, not really a test, but to see if we can't sort of get through that a little bit, let's try the next slide. So I've set up an incredibly scientific chart where I've taken the simple, complicated, complex, and chemical means. And what I would like you to try to do is put the kind of learning, what is a simple learning instance, what is a complicated learning instance, what's a complex one, and what's a chaotic one, and see how we can do with this. So this is a tough one, but uh, as you notice, the, uh, all these radian slides end up being a little harder as we get through. <laughs> but um, I've been trying to explain this quickly for a long time and I always struggle with it. So I thought that today I gave everybody a chance to maybe reflect um, with each other on how they see to see these things break out and see if that doesn't help us a little bit. Driving a stick shift. Yeah, there's one, two, three, four, five. You put in the clutch now. Even with the stick shift, there's a little bit of feel there that happens with a clutch. That's not something I can tell you how to do. But like so many things, you know, what does rhizomatic learning mean? Ah, <laughs> it's a complex question. I agree. That's why I'm trying to take this. Oh, look, the person across the way is waving at me. She put that question in. Some people are not to be trusted. Climate change. You mean a rod? Do you mean what to do with it or what it is? Range windows yourself. Weather prediction. Weather prediction is crazy complex. Yeah. Cool. Avoiding an oncoming car. Problem-based learning. How to write a good English lit paper. You know, it's funny about how to write a paper. There's a sense in which I think you're right about it being complicated, uh, because in so many cases there are set ways to do each piece of the process. You know, in academic writing, I spent years teaching it. Um, it's complicated, but at the end of the day, there is a set way of being able to do it. And it's a word problem is another one that's like that, because often the answer is there. You just have to work your way through it. So a little bit of back channel here that people are a little confused about where we're going. That I apologize for that. It's uh, it's kind of like that. Hmm. Driving a stick shift in the snow. Open heart surgery. Understanding the universe experiment. All right. You want to see the previous slide? I can go back to the previous slide for you, Deb, if you like. Take a quick trip back before we go forward. Is chaotic the same as chaos? Hmm. I think it's chaos is being more like complexity, to be honest with you. 
um, if you if by that you mean chaos theory, because there is an order inside of it. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. I mean, at the end of the day, like anything, a lot of these boundaries bleed together. The reason why I find this so important, and the reason why I think that thinking about this distinction is so important, is that every time that I talk about education, and I talk about change, and I talk about rhizomatic learning, and I talk about what I call an open syllabus, which we'll talk about in a second, people say, well, you're never going to be able to teach people their timetables that way. And I say, of course not. I would never try to teach somebody their times tables this way. Because times tables are things you need to memorize. And memorization lives in the simple domain, right, obviously. And then people say, well, you know, you'll never be able to get people to, to give you the, the sort of what's the right answer to this and, and talking about the complicated thing, complicated domain. I agree. This is not a good way to train people to do that. It may be a good way of training people for chaotic situations. But what I'm claiming is not that it's going to teach anybody, not going to teach anybody how to memorize the timetables. It's not going to get people to remember that the knee bone's connected to the whatever bone it's connected to because I never remember that song. It's not going to do that for you because that's not what it's for. And I think that, like we said at the beginning, and like we're talking about now, learning is one of those things that's different for all of us. The situations are different. And what we're trying to get done is not always the same. It's not always the same. <laughs> I'm sorry that my voice is so soothing. <laughs> Nebo is connected to the thigh bone. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate that. Um, we, had a, we had a request to go back to the previous slide. We're going to take a quick trip back just for a second so Deb can look at it and get a screenshot. Okay, and then we're going to go forward again. There you go, Deb. One, two, three, four, five. All right. So I hope that at some point here we're starting to get, and again, that number four should be five. I apologize. That the, the, Where I'm trying to get to 40 minutes into this is starting to come together. So we need to make students responsible for their own learning and the learning of others. Now, if we take all of this and we talk about the complex domain and we talk about people working in a community and we talk about the rhizome as being moving in uncertain directions and sort of responding and being resilient, and we talk about the goal of the learning as being the complex domain, so not I remember my timetables, not I know the definition of that, but that I understand subtle things about something and that I've learned my way through it, then the key point here and the most important part of this process is the students have to be responsible for the learning. They have to understand what they're looking for coming in and then they have to actually take it upon themselves to engage and to continue to grow and to choose and to, to, to make that syllabus for themselves, to make that those decisions about what it is to learn and what it is to know. They need to be able to create their own learning inside that process. And that's where these, where the, the I think the rhizomatic learning thing comes together is around the idea of an open syllabus. So by open syllabus, I mean that the things that you're going to learn are things that you can actually control, right? I will not speak directly to the Bill of Rights, um, but certainly uh, as Bonnie, who I'm pointing at again, who's in my room, is one of the original signatories, um, there's likely to be some connection there somewhere. What is the imperative for students to be responsible for the learning of others? Do you mean why is there an imperative or what is, like, what's the thing to force them to do that? Yeah, I don't think there is one. Um, I mean, when we look at, I'm going to address Glenn's point here because it really speaks to the challenges of an open syllabus anyway. So when I talk about rhizomatic learning inside of my 20 people classroom, right, so I teach at the University of Prince Edward Island and my authority is held together by my ability to hold people together, but it's also held together by the fact that they have chosen to come to this course, that they're paying 500 or 1,000 or whatever the, the price is to take the course, and that they need it in order to graduate. There's all these structures in our society that force them to, um, force them in there, right? What we have done inside of our education system, there's definitely an agreement. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, and that is exactly what we need to have in order to make 
the open syllabus work is you need a social contract. You need actually a contract. And that's the way that I teach my classes is we get together as a classroom and I start a contract and then they engage with that contract and decide what it is they're going to learn. I don't get involved in teaching until we've actually done that part. So what is it that you're going to decide to do, given the fact that we've got an open syllabus? And to address Allison's point earlier, not Allison Seaman, but um, there's another Allison in here. Um, Allison Adams, why do you have to decide before you come in? Because at some point, in order to start a course, in order to start a learning process, in order to start something that we're pointing at over there, that thing we're going to start on the 12th of February, in order for that to happen, we need to decide where we're starting. We need to decide what it is we're about. Because otherwise, we're just a community, not just a community, we're a community of people hanging out together. Um, if we're not, then there has to be some decision about what we're on about. And that's what a course is. And that's why I think the transition towards the MOOC part of this conversation, that's why I think the course part is so important. Because otherwise, it's the internet, their web communities, those are great, they're just really hard to point in any direction. So if we have a syllabus where we say, we're going to learn about this topic over here, and you get to engage in what you think you want to learn from it, then the student is engaging in that process. They're just, they can change as things go on. They can certainly emerge. The way that their objectives will probably shift as they go along, but they have to come in with some sense that they want to learn it. Otherwise, you've just got some kind of, you know, beat the drum kind of thing where all you're doing is forcing people into places. Bye, Ben. Right. What might be some of the challenges with regard to the subject area? Does it work? Can it work for every situation? Um, Lenandler, that's exactly the point of the simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic thing. There's no way that it's going to work for everything. Like I said, really bad way to remember to get people to remember their timetables. It's, it's not going to work very well for academic writing, I don't think, because there's too many little specific nifty little things that you need to force people to, to, to believe. Right. So no, I would definitely not suggest that that's one of those things that would apply to every situation. Um, there's another piece there I wanted to. Oh, I missed it. Where'd it go? Sorry. Somebody else made a really nice point and I missed it. All right. So there are those, the, the five things that I think I think um, as part of rhizomatic learning, right? And I think I'll just, I'll just review those one more time. It's about preparing people for uncertainty, that community can be the curriculum, that the rhizome is a model for learning, that that idea of it being undefined, reactive, resilient, those kinds of things, that we're talking about the complex domain, we're talking about things that don't have right answers, that are subtle things that you have to come to know, you have to create your way towards knowing. And that student responsibility, student responsibility is critical. It's totally critical to that process. So when we talk about MOOCs, they end up really being a really nice um, way of thinking about open learning, of thinking about rhizomatic learning. If you approach the MOOC as a rhizomatic learning opportunity, this is the way that, that we, we did a video, oh, two years ago now, three years ago now, as part of um, a research project we did for Shirk. And you can find this video online if you look at, um, it's called Success in a MOOC. So if you search for Success in a MOOC somewhere on the internet, you'll find this video. And we talk about a five-step process. So orient, declare, network, cluster, and focus. And I think of this as being one of the ways in which you can talk about rhizomatic learning. When does the focus and cluster take place? I'll address that as we go through. So the first thing you need to do in any kind of situation like this is orient yourself to what's going on. You get a sense of the platform, who's here, what the rules are, what you're trying to get done. Declare yourself. You need a way of talking about yourself and in creating your own knowledge. People need to know who you are to be able to engage with you. Once you've done that, you can start to network. So you find other people who have declared themselves, people who have find your declarations, and you start to meet those people. At some point, if you're clear about what you're trying to get out of it, or if, as Allison uh, Adams suggests, 
if the things that you're trying to do start to emerge, that's when clustering should happen, to address Tim's point, is once you're sure or you've got an idea of what you're trying to get done, what you're trying to learn, the piece that you find interesting, then you find other people who can help you get there and other things that can help you get there. And the last part is focus. And at some point, this is the critical thing for all you guys who are in this MOOC, is that if you want to make it to the end, or if you want to make it to, and that end can be whatever it is, but if you want to make it, have a successful journey through this, Alec or Allison or nobody else is going to be able to tell you what success looks like for you, for you in this. You need to pick a place where success is, right? Um, assessment's coming next. Don't you worry, Lorraine. I've got assessment coming. <laughs> Joanne, too. Um, so that focus is critical. You need to, it's the hard part. I totally agree with you, Roberta, but it's the place where it's the difference between success and failure, personally, for success and failure, right? Um, we can all give you a grade. Uh, hey, you've all got A's. Congratulations. But unless you have your own focus in mind, unless you have your own idea of what you're trying to get done, then you're not going to be able to judge for yourself whether or not the experience was a successful one. Um, the problem is that, and this is the quote uh, Jennifer Madrill, a person I worked with for years, or have worked with for years, is that you can't collaborate alone, right? And that's where, when we start out, we need to have places to collaborate with. And whether those things are communities, like EdTech Talk, like all the communities we talked about earlier, or whether it's a MOOC, to me they're gathering places. And the beauty of the MOOC is that as it is tonight, we have 95 people who have all gathered together um, to talk to me for some reason, but to get together and sort of think their way through new ideas, maybe to be confronted with some things they hadn't thought of before, if only to disagree with them. But that's the beauty of a MOOC. The Internet's a big, wide, crazy place where you can learn anything you want, but it's hard to find places to come together. And the MOOC, to me, more than anything else, is a gathering place where we have some idea of what we're going to talk about, but we don't necessarily have um, we all could, that's really nice Alec we all decided to walk through the same door on the internet so we could think together well wow, that's really nice somebody copy and paste that for me because I'm stealing it I'm stealing it that's so good and and I just I want to drop this one on you kind of like a network textbook um, and I just I just drop this idea in and let you guys think about this because it is a bit of a crazy party. Um, in a sense, and I'm still working through this idea, it's a brand, it's one that it's, I've been talking about for a couple months and I still don't totally understand it. But it is, a textbook is the gathering of, you know, random things around the top. I mean, think about what a textbook really is. You've got people somewhere who decided that on this topic, we're going to pull this content together and strip it together. And now, you know, based on what one department has and whatever, but really, it's just a bunch of different texts brought together, right? And that's something we can do really easily. Um, and I think a MOOC is something that is, in a sense, its own assemblage of things and learnings and people, and it's not just an assemblage of texts, per se, like written texts, but more broadly an assemblage of lots of ways of interacting and learning and all that stuff together. And I think that there's something, assemblage is a fantastic word. <laughs> We're coming to assessment. Man, people love assessment. All right. So there's some problems, obviously. Obviously there are some problems. This is my son, Oscar. Um, or I should say our son, Oscar, Bonnie and I. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Bonnie. He is your son, too, totally. Um, so, he, yes, he's cute. You can all say he's cute. I would appreciate that. Um, and that, there are a lot of challenges inside of this, you know. And I'd like to give you guys a chance, and I know we don't have a lot of time here, but give you guys a chance to talk about some of those challenges some of those problems that you see with what we've been talking about so far. And then I'm going to wrap up real quick with the last couple of points I want to make. So you guys can all put assessment on there. Uh, one of the problems is that people don't scale, right? So whenever you get inside the MOOC conversation, if what you're looking for is access to Alec, um, if there are 96 other people who are trying to talk to him, it's going to be tough. 
So what are some of the other challenges when we get to the scale and we talk about um, we talk about rhizomatic learning when we talk about MOOCs? What are some of those challenges? Our K-12 students type faster. Notion scalability changing the social media. Yeah, I think it is. I think we're getting more accustomed to scale, to different different levels of scale because of social media. I think that um, fitting rhizomatic into a linear environment. Yeah, it doesn't like to do that. It's really tough to do that. I and mean, I'm really lucky with the course that I teach at UPEI that I have the ability to make decisions like the ones that I do, where I do walk in with an open syllabus, where I do walk in um, allowing students to some degree to choose their own grades. Um, and choose how much work they want to do. Um, yeah, it's not something you can do in a lot of places. It does totally reframe the role of experts in learning. Yeah, it sure does. Time, it's always a struggle. Do learners freak out when you challenge them to learn this way? <laughs> they sure do. Uh, yeah, no, I've had, uh, this last time I taught my, uh, my course, which is taught to teachers, um, I didn't have anybody break down, like totally get upset the first day. It's the first time since I've taught the course that that's happened. That is, that that hasn't happened where somebody has gotten really upset with me. I've had people shout at me uh, about this, particularly because I teach teachers for the most part. Uh, and, you know, they ask me, like, how can I possibly succeed if I don't know what I'm supposed to do? You know, tell me how to succeed in this course. And I say, look, um, I'm not going to be there. When you leave this course and you're back in your workplace and you try to use any of the ideas in this class, I'm not going to be there to help you. So there's no sense in me creating a dependency relationship where I tell you now what your success is going to look like. I tell you how to, how to deal with the uncertainty you're dealing with. I'll support you. I'm here to support you. Um, but if I take all of the power in this situation, if I am the only power in this situation, then you're going to leave this with a power relationship cut off. And how is that going to help you deal with uncertainty when you get back to your place? Yeah, it's more like a mentor or a coach. <laughs> like biting into blue cheese, nom, 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 making me hungry. All right, so um, Alec tells me I have a bit more time, but... Uh, I want to deal with two giant problems that I see. Uh, accountability to yourself and to your learning. You're so used to being accountable to others in the hierarchy of the school system. I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you anymore. I think that's totally right, and I think that that is exactly the thing that I have positioned myself in opposition to. If we create a group, if we, I think we have probably inadvertently created this, an educational system that teaches people to be obedient. Um, and that is the opposite of preparing them to be creative and to make their own decisions and to make good decisions. And I think that that has very broad ranging impacts on how our culture is set up and how all those things work, right? If you have people who are constantly looking for the right answer and you confront them with a complex situation, like, should we have the XL pipeline? For those of you who are not North American, that's a giant oil pipeline that comes from some place in Canada and some place in the United States. Um, you can say, no, it's too dangerous. And you can say, yes, we need it to make money. It's a complex situation. There are lots and lots and lots of details. And I think we need to make smart decisions about those things. But they can't, about, they can't be about right and wrong. They have to be about looking the culture of certainty. I totally think that that's, is that a book that somebody wrote? By someone I can't remember. Thanks, Kristen. <laughs> Kristen, if you're on Twitter, if you could send me the, the link to that, that'd be fantastic. Okay, so I've, I've given some of the, the grand visioning here. Let me go on to two other points I wanted to, wanted to address that are problems with what we're talking about. And this is one that you'll see, sorry for anybody that cut, up on the last, cut off on the slides uh, while we're going through. Um, I could spend all night on each one of those slides. <laughs> so um, this is a big, big piece of both rhizomatic learning uh, in my classrooms and a big, big piece of the MOOC issue as well, is that people don't want other people to see their stuff. 
People think they own the things that they've written. People think they should be paid for the stuff that they've, that they've put out there. And that idea of openness inside of the MOOC is one that we have lost sight of in this whole crazy MOOC talk in, in so many different locations. Certainly not what I've seen inside of uh, the work that Alec and you guys are doing here. But openness is not about being free, right? It's not about saying, oh, I didn't pay money to do this. It's way more than that. And it's about sharing. And I think you guys had Shiresky in here, so he probably did a big share, share, share talk. Um, but I think that this is a critical part of the learning process. It's essential for rise of medical learning, and it's the thing that makes MOOCs so potentially valuable is that it teaches us all that when we share what we have um, and we give away, the, yeah, time for a group hug, totally. Yeah. I love you guys. Openness is totally an attitude. I think I was not surprised that Cog Dog back me up there. Okay, so um, only 1,700 slides left. <laughs> ah, Nancy White, how awesome, she, how awesome is she? Okay, so I want to address, I wanted to make that one comment about openness and how important it is. I also want to talk about this. So we need to measure that learning. How are we supposed to know that people have learned? How can we assure, be assured that the process is happening? How many people believe that this is true, that we absolutely need to be able to do this? I mean, yes or no? Do we need to be able to do this? I see everybody's caught in their separate conversations. Oh, yes. Wow, that's a lot of yeses. <clears throat> ah, Alex tricking us through here. He's trying to change the question. Right. Okay, here's my position on this, and, and I, I would say that you're free to disagree with me, but I have a funny feeling that whether I said you were free to or not, you would disagree with me anyway, which is part of why it's so much fun talking to you guys. So my position is that the fact that you need it doesn't mean we can actually do it. And I think that the fact that we need to be able to measure learning, and I particularly mean the word measure, that is check how much you've learned and know how much you've learned. Not see whether or not learning has happened over there, vaguely speaking, whether or not you've gotten somewhere. University admissions need measurement? I don't think they do. I work for, I, I work as part of the recruitment team at my university. Those kinds of measurements, the measurement of learning that we do is not something we need. That's point you've been all night. So my response then is that I don't care how much you need it. What you're doing is not measuring learning. Even though you need it, even though you need it for, to be able to check that the government's doing well, even though you need it to make sure that the school's going well, even though you need to be able to check it broadly to see whether or not you know, good things are happening. Yeah, exactly. You can only measure performance. Exactly the point. So my response is just stop measuring it. Stop trying to measure it. Because every time you try to measure learning, the best things can't be measured. Every time you try to do it, employers seem to think they need... I don't know that that's true. Some employers have believed that they need to be able to measure learning. But at the end of the day, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, can I really give myself a 76 on how well I cook? Well, it's a silly question. There's no way to talk about it that way, right? Those aren't the kinds of things that we measure in our day-to-day -day lives, but we have this fanciful belief that somehow it's almost like a, well, we can we break down a rubric to close enough detail. We have some kind of decom chart that allows us to really decide what exactly has happened over there. To me, we're not measuring learning. If we can measure effort and engagement and connection, right? If those are the things we're talking about, I can tell you how many times somebody posted. I can tell you how many connections they've made. And there's some ways of getting robots to do that. You know, there are ways of checking to see how many links and how many different things that they've done. Those things are possible. But until, if those students are responsible for their own learning, for measuring their own learning, we count them up with some robots to make sure that there's something happening over there. Then I think, and we make the community that curriculum, right? Then it's all about membership. It's all about belonging. 
And I think that if you can become a member inside of a community of knowing, right, that means that you know how to use the language. It means that you know how to interact. It means that you're able, I just went back to the slide for it by request there. It means that you understand the complexities of what's happening inside of that field to the point that you're able to perform it. And that idea of membership and belonging, I think, is the goal that we can be working towards. So there, <laughs> in an hour, and I think I just about hit an hour, is my pitch for Rhizomatic Learning. So we've got some time out, tells me, do a little Q&A at the end. So and you can also feel free You can also feel free to fire off stuff at, at Dave Cormier that comes up to you or arguments that you have later on. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. All right, Dave. That was awesome. I really want to thank Dave, uh, but I won't take up the airtime here. Uh, we'll give him a, if we want to provide him with uh, some questions and answers uh, or quest sorry, questions here at this time. Sorry, I've got uh, the kid programming in the background here. Uh, Dave, as you mentioned, is on Twitter. It's at Dave Cormier. But this would be a great time to grab him for some questions. I know there's a lot of questions around, uh, you know, how do we assess even things like engagement, as he has said, uh, other good questions out there. Uh, feel free to uh, drop one in the chat, or if you want to use the uh, audio, just click on the, uh, the microphone button, and you can ask Dave one that you'd like to articulate uh, with your voice. Let me know. Hi, Dave. Um, I'm wondering what kind of reactions you've had from other professors um, in university, because these ideas really excite me. What kind of pushback have you had from them? Um, do they think you're crazy? Um, and yeah, just some feedback on that. Um, uh, I just got in there before anybody else in the chat room would follow in. Yeah, uh, lots of people think I'm crazy um, for lots of reasons. Uh, I think my favorite story about this from another faculty member uh, comes from a faculty member at my university who um, came to one of the MOOCs that we did and he followed the rhizomatic learning path exactly the way I would have described it for him. He, he came in, um, he probably made it through five weeks, I think it was uh, Futures, Ed Futures was the MOOC that he was in, and he stopped me going across the the lawn at the university one day and said, I absolutely hate your MOOCs. I think they're dumb. I said, well, uh, okay, um, that's too bad. Can you give me some sense of why you hate them? He said, well, I took it. I started your course and I followed along, but I didn't finish it. And I said, well, um, you didn't finish it. Well, that, you know, I, I don't think that's a huge deal, but can you explain to me, can you tell me how the process actually worked for you? And he said, well, you know, I went in and I met this guy and I started talking to him and then we got together and we had this idea about the one of the points that you guys were making and we ended up writing this paper and we went and presented it at a conference. I said, well, that sounds fantastic. I mean, that is the five-step process. You said who you were, you found somebody, you networked, you clustered, you focused, you got all this stuff done. What's the problem? Because, well, I didn't finish. And to me, that is the great challenge that everybody has, right, is that they're like, well, this is what learning is. It's the thing where I prove, I, you show me what I'm supposed to do and I go ahead and I do it over here and then, you know, the person in charge tells me I've succeeded. And I, there's a lot of pushback around that. Um, at the same time, the other thing that I've noticed in talking about this is that there's always a segment of the people who are listening who go, wow, that's exactly what I've been doing for years. Right? And, and it's totally likely that I've entirely stolen all this stuff just from looking at people whose teaching I really admire. Um, but that, those are the two poles of the response that I get. I get people who, when I start talking about it, it's immediate recognition. Right? They just go, wow, this is, this is what I do. And other people who go, well, this isn't what learning is. This is, learning is this thing over here, and it's been that way for a long time, and what are you doing about this? Even though that their participation in that shows them something different. So are there any other questions for Dave there? Paul has got them. 
Uh, there might be a few in the chat today. Well, people work past their comfort level. Um, I think that. So can I ask? Oh yeah, so go can ahead. Can I ask one more, one more question? Um, so I'm trying to get this in my head. Um, how do you think this would work in a high school situation? Because um, here in um, Surrey, British Columbia, we're doing a lot of genius hour where we're letting students being able to have certain time during the week to explore what they want to learn and then present it to um, their classmates, which should be a community of learners. But how do you see this? Can you give me a snapshot in your head on how this would work in a high school? Um, I can do better than that. I can point you to somebody who is doing absolutely fantastic work uh, doing exactly that. Um, oh, geez, I know her handle, Monica Hardy. Um, I'm just trying to find some of her stuff here. If you look at Monica, the stuff that Monica Hardy is doing in Lavalin, Colorado, um, she has done some amazing things um, with students of the age that you're talking about, where they've really broken down the boundaries uh, around, oh, here's, the, here's some of the video. Here you go. They've really broken down the boundaries around what's possible and what is what they're supposed to do, that kind of stuff. Um, really excellent stuff. So I heartily suggest that you, you check out Monica's work um, in how their students slowly, I mean, they have to, there's a process of, of, um, of removing some of the enculturation that's part of that too, particularly with kids, you know. Um, I think with adults, the response to this can be a lot more positive because you can draw on their experiences and you can say to somebody, look, think about all the things you've learned and think about how you actually went about doing that. Not the stuff that you learned in the classroom, but just the learning process that you're normally, that you normally do. And you can normally draw connections between that learning process and what we're trying to do inside the classroom. And I find that works really well with somebody who's 40, has life experience and that stuff. With kids, I think, particularly kids who are in high school, they've been enculturated to respond. Anybody who's taught first year university students knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and I think that you need to deprogram it. Again, that's, that's a big part of some of the work that Monica's done. Um, and if you send me um, a message later, um, I'll get you more of her stuff once I remember where it is. But that YouTube video is certainly a good example. And then somebody popped in her, um, her uh, Twitter account as well. I want to address um, one of the things that uh, somebody said earlier. Oh, yeah, uh, Lost Lizard, an interesting name. Uh, will people work past their comfort level? I think of that as the ultimate, as ultimately the most important responsibility that I have in the classroom, is trying to get people to work past their comfort level. Um, I'm trying to get them to the point where they're able, that's, I mean, that's kind of my job, and somebody said earlier it's kind of like being a counselor, and it kind of is. I want them to feel like somebody's going to catch them if they're pushing past their comfort level. Because as I tell my students when they come in, you're going to be here, and I teach mostly summer and spring courses, you're going to be here outside of your work time, outside of all this other stuff, you've decided to come to my class. This is something you're doing. Let's not waste our time. Let's, let's push ourselves as far as we can. And, and that is a, a big part of that message and a big part of trying to get people past those comfort levels. And I think in the places where you can do that, in the places where you can support people enough that they feel like they can bring themselves past their comfort level, that's when the real crazy learning starts to happen. All right, so we've, um, uh, there, there's a question around evaluating engagement that came up from a couple of people. I don't know if you're willing to think about that one, Dave, uh, but I know it's come up a little bit because I think one of your slides does mentioned those are the sort of the things that we could measure instead. So what do you think? Yeah, that's probably the hardest question on the board. Um, I wasn't ignoring it exactly, but I, I would have been okay if it had slipped past. Um, I think that um, measuring uh, connection and stuff is stuff that you can do. Uh, this math that you can do there, particularly online, and that's one of the places where working on the internet really helps you out. There's some ways in which you can use social network analysis and stuff to sort of get a sense of what some people are doing. I think you can also use uh, a variety of peer evaluation techniques to do that too. So 
Um, and also a fair amount of one of the other things that I do is um, student declaration stuff. So I'll take um, a combination of SNA, so social network analysis, and that's like a giant map that says, um, here are all of the connections inside of the course that this person has made. So it'll show the lines and the strength of lines and all that stuff. So some math stuff. The second one is, how exactly are you supporting other people? So if people are saying, you know, I want to be able to, uh, th this person has helped me in this way and there's that kind of stuff. So you'll have ways in which that peer evaluation can also work. The third one is, is a straight declaration where people say, um, will tell me with links and references what kind of work they've done to push themselves, push the people they're working with. And I find that if you cross-reference two or three or four of those kinds of things, how engaged somebody is comes out pretty clear, right? You can't fake that kind of stuff. So as long as you have more than one method, you cross-reference it a little bit, and you know you know the thing that you're doing. I think that you can measure engagement in that way. I'm going to throw in a uh, paper for people who are still wondering about that. It's from Griff Richards. It's uh, it's actually on measuring engagement using uh, learning analytics. And I don't know if it answers the question, but it maybe gets you thinking about a different way of doing it, certainly in online learning. Um, I don't know if you can do it. In, it's not quite the same sort of thing, I think, in the classroom, but at least uh, in the online learning sense, it could be uh, something that you would look at anyway. So there's a, there's a seed of an article uh, to get you started anyway. So I don't want to leave, uh, keep Dave here all night. It's probably like, one or two or three a.m. in PEI. I'm not even sure it's so far away. Uh, so we want to make sure that you know Dave gets some rest because he's got a uh, tomorrow. I think he's doing a session. I think at uh, one one p.m. Eastern again to do a repeat for people who missed it. So uh, if you did miss it or if you came late or if you want to hear Dave again, uh, he's doing it again. So I want to thank you again, Dave, for a fantastic presentation. There's been um, great comments here in um, Blackboard, but also on Twitter. So. Uh, again, thanks for thanks for your wisdom and for working so hard on this topic because I think it's just it, it's got major uh, you know some some legs and something to really think about uh, in, in in sort of our contemporary learning environment. So thanks again, Dave. Really appreciate it, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Thanks everybody. I really enjoyed it. It was great. Thanks for engaging so well. Thanks for asking our questions too. I really appreciate it. It helps me push my work as well. <laughs>